Hey everybody, and welcome to our first lecture in numerical analysis. Uh, we've got some really good stuff to cover this summer. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, a lot of our arguments are going to be common sense driven, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, very intuitive, and uh, I think we can learn quite a bit. I think we're going to have a very good summer. So let's get started with a few basics, uh, some reminders of things we've seen in the past, but perhaps haven't had much of an occasion to use since. Here's the first thing uh, that we need to know for numerical analysis. And this is called Taylor series. Uh, we all saw this at the end of Calculus 2 if we were on the semester system. And we saw this junk and we thought, what on earth is this? What does this have to do with anything? And probably until this very moment, we've never really had an occasion to consider Taylor series again. But here's what the theorem tells us. Suppose that f of x is such that all of its derivatives exist. First derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative, fifth derivative, and so forth. By the way, uh, when we use the prime notation for the derivatives, uh, we stop at the third derivative. After that, uh, this notation becomes very cumbersome and hard to interpret. So for the fourth derivative on, we put the order of the derivative, in this case four, in parentheses. So if we were using the prime notation, this would be the same thing as f quadruple prime. So fourth derivative, fifth derivative, sixth derivative, and so forth. All of the derivatives of f of x exist. Taylor's theorem tells us that f of x is equal to the sum of these things from n equals 0 to infinity. The nth derivative of f evaluated at c times x minus c to the nth power over n factorial. And C is called the center of the series. By the way, if N is 0, then we have the 0th derivative of F evaluated at C. And the 0th derivative of a function is just the function itself. So the zeroth derivative of f evaluated at c is just f evaluated at c. So for n equals 0, we have the zeroth derivative, f evaluated at c, x minus c to the 0, over 0 factorial. Then n is incremented to 1. And we have first derivative of f evaluated at c times x minus c to the first, all over 1 factorial. Then n is uh, incremented to 2. So we have the second derivative of f evaluated at c, times x minus c squared, over 2 factorial, and so forth. And this can be simplified just a little bit. Zero factorial is one by definition. X minus C to the zero power is just one. So we have F evaluated at the center, C, plus f prime of c times x minus c, 1 factorial is 1, 
And then the rest of these things are pretty much as they appeared before. Two factorial is just two. So that is Taylor's series. It may have been a while since we've had Cal 2, and we may not have seen Taylor's series since. So I'll leave this up on the board for a few seconds so we can copy it down. It turns out in numerical analysis, we'll use this quite a bit. Uh, this is going to be one of our big tools. Okay, let's uh, do an example of this. Okay, here's our first example. For f of x equals sine of x, write the Taylor series with center c equals pi over 4. Show the first five terms explicitly. So I guess that means we're going to have to know if we show the first five terms, that's the zeroth term, the first term, second term, third term, fourth term, or rather, zeroth derivative, first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative. So zeroth derivative is just f of x, that's sine of x. First derivative is cosine, second derivative is negative sine, Third derivative is negative cosine, fourth derivative is sine x, and so forth. Now let's write down our Taylor series formula. F evaluated at C is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of the nth derivative evaluated at c, x minus c to the n over n factorial. And let's see, what is that going to be explicitly? For n equals 0, this is the zeroth derivative of f, which is f evaluated at c, times x minus c to the 0 over n factor uh, over zero factorial and increments to one so we have the first derivative f prime of c x minus c to the first over one factorial now n increments to two and we have the second derivative times x minus c to the second over 2 factorial. Second derivative, x minus c to the second over 2 factorial. n increments to 3. So n is 3. We have the third derivative. x minus 3 to the n, n is 3, over 3 factorial. And now n increments to 4. So we have fourth derivative evaluated at c. x minus c to the n, where n is 4. all over n factorial, where n is 4, and so on.
Now I guess the next thing we'll do is take f and all of its derivatives and write them in terms of sine and cosine. And we'll take c, which is pi over 4 and plug that in. So f sine of x evaluated at pi over 4. times x minus c pi over 4 to the 0 over 0 factorial now f prime is cosine evaluated at c which is pi over 4 times x minus pi over 4 to the first over 1 factorial. And now we go to the second derivative. That's negative sine of x. So negative sine evaluated at c pi over 4, x minus pi over 4, squared all over 2 factorial. Ooh, I may need a shoehorn to fit all of this in. Then we have plus third derivative, which is negative cosine of x evaluated at pi over 4 times x minus c, pi over 4, cubed over 3 factorial. And our last term that we'll show explicitly, fourth derivative, which is sine of x evaluated at c, pi over 4, times x minus c to the fourth over four factorial plus dot dot dot. Now the good news is some of this is going to be simplified. x minus pi over four to the zero, that's just one. Zero factorial, that's just one. So, all we have to do is figure out what sine of pi over 4 is, and that turns out to be square root of 2 over 2. Okay, go to the next term. 1 factorial is just 1, so we're not really dividing by anything other than 1. Cosine of pi over 4 is also square root of 2 over 2. x minus pi over 4. Oops. Then the next term. Sine of pi over 4 again, that's square root of 2 over 2. x minus pi over 4 squared over 2 factorial. 2 factorial is just 2. So what I have here is square root of 2 over 2 over 2 I can simplify that a little bit, and I'm just going to write square root of 2 on top and 4 on the bottom. Next term, cosine of pi over 4, that's square root of 2 over 2 also. x minus pi over 4 cubed over 
three factorial. Uh, three factorial, let's see, one times two times three, that's six. Times two is 12. So why don't we just put all of this over one number? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to tidy this up a little bit more on the next line, believe it or not. Uh, the last term that we'll show explicitly, sine of pi over 4, square root of 2 over 2, x minus pi over 4 to the 4th, all over 4 factorial. But what is 4 factorial? That's 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. 24, right? So we have 24 times 2. That's just 48. And I think what I'll do now, just for the sake of appearance and nothing else, is I'll put that x minus pi over 4 is by themselves with some coefficient out front. So uh, we'll have square root of 2 over 2 plus square root of 2 over 2 x minus pi over 4 minus square root of 2 over 4 times x minus pi over 4 squared. Square root of 2 over 12 times x minus pi over 3 cubed. plus square root of 2 over 48 x minus pi over 4 to the 4th plus garbage. Oh, and I, I like the appearance of that so much more than what I had. So you know what, I'm just going to erase this. If I erased it before you were ready, uh, forgive me. But we can just back up the film or back up the recording if we need to catch something. I'm going to let this be my answer. So let's see. Yep. So that's the Taylor series expansion for sine of x with center pi over 4. Now, a lot of times we'll make our Taylor series a lot less complicated than this and a lot more visually appealing but by making a special choice of the center series. And oftentimes the ideal choice for a center is C equals zero. I will talk about that next. Oftentimes, when we consider Taylor series and when we create the Taylor series expansion for a function, uh, we use c equals zero as the center. Uh, we get something that's a lot prettier, a lot less complicated, something that's a lot more useful. So unless we have a 
really good reason for doing otherwise, and sometimes we do, but usually we don't. Unless we have a really good reason for doing otherwise, uh, we choose the center C to be zero. Uh, this is what our Taylor series expansion is. And if we put in C equals zero, Uh, this is what we get. Oh, by the way, something isn't quite right here. This N hmm, should be right here, denoting the nth derivative. So we have the nth derivative evaluated at zero times x minus zero which is just x to the nth power, but over n factorial. When n is 0, we have the 0th derivative, or f, evaluated at n, times x to the 0, which is 1, over 0 factorial, which is 1. So that's just f evaluated at 0. When n is incremented to 1, we have the first derivative evaluated at 0 times x to the first over 1 factorial, but that's just 1. Okay, n is incremented to 2, so we'll have the second derivative evaluated at 0. Times x squared over 2 factorial. Now n is incremented to 3, so we'll have the third derivative evaluated at 0. Times x to the third over 3 factorial. Now let's see. Let me see. What would be a good example? I know. I'll give two examples for homework, but I'll also do an example which will be very much like one of our homework exercises just so that we can have something to use for reference. Let's do the Taylor series expansion for f of x equals sine of x with center 0. OK, derive the Taylor series expansion for f of x equals sine of x with center c equals 0. And this is what the Taylor series expansion for f of x looks like. The Taylor series expansion with center c equals 0. This is what we just derived a minute ago. This is what it looks like. And it looks like we're going to have to compute a bunch of things. We're going to have to compute f of 0, f prime of 0, f double prime of 0, and so forth. So here are the values right over here. 
the zeroth derivative, that's just sine evaluated at zero is zero. F prime is cosine, cosine of zero is one. F double prime, that's negative sine evaluated at zero is zero. F triple prime, third derivative, that's negative cosine evaluated at zero is negative one. Fourth derivative evaluated at zero, that's sine evaluated at zero is zero, and so on and so forth. Now all we have to do is plug in f of zero, f prime of zero, and so forth. And I'll give myself a little bit of space here. f of 0, that's 0. f prime of 0, that's 1. Whoops, whoops, whoops. f times x, forgive me. f prime of 0 is 1 times x. F double prime of zero, that's negative sine of zero, which is zero, times x squared over two. F triple prime of zero, that's negative cosine of zero, which is negative one. So we have negative one times x cubed over three. Yeah, let me put the negative one in there just so we don't wonder what happened. Fourth derivative evaluated at zero. That's sine of zero, which is zero. So we have zero times x to the fourth over four factorial. Next term. Fifth derivative evaluated at zero, that's cosine of zero, which is one. Times x to the fifth over five factorial. Plus the next term. Sixth derivative evaluated at zero. That's negative sine of zero, which is zero. Next term, seventh derivative evaluated at zero. That's negative cosine of zero, which is negative one. Negative one times x to the seventh over seven factorial, dot, dot, dot. And we'll simplify this a little bit. x minus x 
cubed over 3 factorial. plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial and when we leave out the zero terms it turns out that the exponent increases by 2 each time. The denominator, I'm sorry, yeah. The denominator, the factorial, increases by 2 each time. We have 1 factorial, 3 factorial, 5 factorial, 7 factorial. And all of these things are odd numbers x to the first over 1 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the fifth over 5 factorial, x to the seventh over 7 factorial. And as far as integers go and natural numbers go, all natural numbers, all integers, they're either even or odd. If they're even, we can write them as 2 times something. If they're odd, we can write them as 2 times some integer plus 1. So it looks like the general form that we have here we have negative 1 to some power. We'll get to that in a minute. The exponent is an odd number, so we'll say x to the 2n plus 1. And the denominator is the factorial of the exponent in the numerator, so this is going to be 2n plus 1 factorial. And let's see. The terms alternate positive, negative, positive, negative. Now, if we use this formula to get the first term, and this is x to the first over 1 factorial, that means that 2n plus 1 equals 1. What does n have to be? zero. So this is the n equals zero term. This is the first term, second term, third term. And so it looks like we want the, the sign changer, negative one, raised to the nth power. Let's see. When n is zero, we have negative 1 to the 0 is positive 1, so this is 1. And we have two, x to the 2 times 0 plus 1, which is just x to the first, over 2, z, two times 0 plus 1 factorial. That's 1 factorial. That works. Let's try it on the next term just to make sure. Uh, here n is 1. Negative 1 to the 1 power is negative 1. We got the sign right. And we have x to the power of 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. Yep. And on the bottom, 2 times 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3 factorial. Yep. Okay. This is exactly what this is. This is exactly what this is. It's the sum n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. Now, notice that we did something. 
going from here to our series written as it is here, and then going to this representation of the series, we redid the index. We got rid of all the zero terms by redoing our index n. Now, this is the Taylor series expansion for sine of x And I'll use my red marker again. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know what? Let me add to this. Okay, that's much better. Uh, this is something we should know. And when I say we should know it, uh, I mean that we should have it memorized. I'm not being too unreasonable because there are not many Taylor series that we want to memorize, but this is one of them that we do want to memorize. Uh, essentially, we want to know the Taylor series expansion for sine of x with center zero, cosine of x with center zero, e to the x with center zero, and we might want to know a Taylor series for natural log of x, I'm not sure. But definitely sine of x, cosine of x, and e to the x. We want to know those Taylor series uh, with center zero. Now, having gone through that example, I'll give our first homework assignment for the term. And if it's challenging, that's good. If it's not, that's good too. But we should do these out. And our homework assignment is essentially uh, derive the Taylor series expansion for e to the x and cosine of x with center c equals zero. I'll write that down. Ta-da! Here is our first homework assignment. Uh, since I intend to redo this video in future semesters, uh, I'll give you the due date by email and by Canvas. But here's our first homework assignment. Derive the Taylor series expansions with center C equals zero for F of X equals cosine of X and we will want to redo the index just as we did with sine of x. And secondly, derive the Taylor series expansion, center c equals zero, for f of x equal e to the x. And there will be no need to redo the index here. Uh, every term of this expansion is non-zero, so there's no need to redo the index, and we couldn't even if we wanted to. Uh, with cosine of x, we're going to see the situation that we saw with sine of x. Every other term is going to be zero, so there's going to be a way to redo the index so that we get rid of all of the zero terms. Since we just finished talking about Taylor series, maybe the first thing that we should discuss is Newton's method.
Uh, Newton's method is used to solve equations of the form f of x equals zero, where f of x is differentiable. In other words, f of x exists, f prime of x exists, f double prime, f triple prime, fourth derivative, they all exist. So our goal is, given some differentiable function f of x, we want to be able to solve this equation, f of x equals zero. And for some functions, that's pretty easy. But suppose that we had something like this. With sine of x, e to the x, uh, x to the fifth minus 3x squared equals zero. Uh, something like that. And this whole thing is our f of x. Well, this would be a nasty thing to have to solve. So this is why we have things such as Newton's method. We use Newton's method to solve equations of this form, where f of x is differential. And in order to do this, we need the definition of f of x, the definition of f prime, and a fairly good guess as to the solution of the equation. And think about it. If x is such that f of x equals zero, then x is the solution. So we're looking for x such that f of x equals zero. Now, typically, we'd write a computer program to do this, which is why I mentioned input. Uh, in our computer program, we define f of x. And then we'd also define the definition f prime of x. And we'd prompt the user for a good guess as to the solution x of this equation. So that's our input. Now let's talk about how it works. We're back. Here's how we proceed. Uh, we let our initial guess, x of naught, be the center of a Taylor series expansion of f of x. Our guess, x of naught, as to our solution x, is actually our first approximation of x. And if we're going to guess, we're going to try to guess close. So x of naught is our first approximation of the solution x. It's our first guess as to the value of the solution x. And we're going to use our guess, our approximation x of naught, as the center of a Taylor series expansion of f of x. So here's what that Taylor series expansion of f of x with center x naught looks like. And we'll write out the first few terms. When n is 0, we have the 0th derivative of f, which is just f itself. So f evaluated at x of naught. We have x minus x naught to the 0, which is 1. 0 factorial, which is 1. So this whole thing is just 1. That leaves us with f of x naught as our first term. When n is 1, we have first derivative f prime. Holy moly. Did I leave something out? I think I did. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. 
Hold on a second, let me correct this, and I do apologize. It must have been all those martinis I had for lunch. Okay, I apologize for that horrible miscarriage of mathematical justice. Let's try this again. N is zero. We have the zeroth derivative of f, which is just f itself, evaluated at x of naught. We have x minus x naught to the zero, which is one. One factorial, which is one. So this whole thing is just one. Now, n increments to 1, so we have the first derivative evaluated at x of naught, x minus x naught to the first over 1 factorial, which is 1. n increments to 2, so we have the second derivative of f evaluated at x of naught times x minus x naught to the second power over 2 factorial. n increments to 3, so we have the third derivative evaluated at x of naught, times x minus x naught to the third, over 3 factorial, and so on and so forth. Now we want to note something. Uh, we wanted our guess, x of naught, to be a fairly good guess as to the value of x. So here's what we can, uh, well, I'll tell you what. I'll erase a little bit of the board. x of naught is presumed to be a fairly good guess for the solution of the equation x. And if x is a good guess as to the value, I'm sorry, if x naught is a good guess as to the value of x, then they're going to be close together. If x naught is a good guess as to the value of x, they're going to be close together, so x minus x naught will be small. Uh, less than 1, definitely. So what happens if we take something small, less than 1, in magnitude, and we square it? If we take something whose magnitude is less than 1 and square it, don't we get something even smaller in magnitude? So if x naught is close to x, x minus x naught will be small. x minus x naught squared will be even smaller. x minus x naught cubed will be yet even smaller, and so on. So this is going to be small, and we're dividing it by 2. This is going to be even smaller, and we're dividing it by 3 factorial, which is 6. This is going to be even smaller, and we're dividing it by 4 factorial, which is 24. So if 
we get a good guess as to the value of x, x minus x naught will be small. And this term, this term, and this term, and so on, will be small in magnitude. We're going to assume that our guess is good enough so that this term, this term, and this term, here they are again, this term, this term, and this term, are small enough that we can just throw them in the wastebasket, and it's not going to make much of a difference. So how did I get this? I just threw this term and this term and this term and this term and this term. I just threw them all in the wastebasket. I took all of these terms that are kind of small and just threw them away. And that left me with this. Now, they're not equal, but they're close. That's why I say approximately equal. Okay, here's where I get all excited and I say something like, hold the phone. Well, let's see, what does that mean? I guess that's what they said in the old days when uh, newspapers and uh, radio journalists were getting their information over the phone and they wanted uh, people to hang on for an incoming news flash. Hold the phone. Okay. We need to make use of some of our observations that we haven't made yet. And now would be the perfect time to do that. Let's remind ourselves of what we've assumed, because this is critical. f of x is 0, uh, which equivalently means that x is the solution of the equation f of x equals 0. 
So that means we can rewrite this equation. Yeah, we'll call it an equation, even though it's only an approximation. f of x equals 0. So this thing should be 0. This equation is actually 0 is approximately equal to f of x of naught plus f prime of x of naught times x minus x of naught. And let's remind ourselves of what we're looking for here. Uh, we're looking for the solution of this equation, and that's x. That's what we're looking for. This is what we want. Let's solve for it. First thing I do, I'll move this term to the other side. Ah, so far so good, okay. Next thing I'll do, I'll divide by f prime. And I'm not going to fit that down at the bottom of the board, okay. I'm looking for x, so I'll just move this x naught to the other side. We'd be done if it weren't for one thing. Uh, this is not an equal sign here. This is approximately equal. So what we have is an approximation to the value of x. Our, this is going to be our next approximation. 
x sub 0 is our initial approximation. This is going to be our next approximation. So look at that for a second. Okay, here's an observation that we want to make. X of 1, which is our current approximation of X, how about putting a comma here? x of 1, which is our current approximation of x, is formulated in terms of x of naught, our previous approximation of x. Here's our current approximation of x, and it's formulated in terms of x of naught, its predecessor. So maybe we should just continue this pattern. What's our next approximation? If x sub n is our current approximation, this is our next approximation. Okay, let's see what I want to say. I guess this is a reality check. Wake up and smell the coffee. This algorithm depends heavily on our initial approximation, x of naught, being close to x. See, we said that we could throw all of these terms of the Taylor series in the wastebasket because x minus x naught is small. And x minus x naught quantity squared is even smaller. And x naught, uh, x minus x naught cubed is even smaller than that. Well, these things are only going to be true if x naught and x are close together. In other words, these things are only going to be true if x of naught is a good approximation to x. 
and if x0 is a good approximation of x, then our sequence of successive approximations, x0, x1, x2, dot, 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 will converge to our solution x. These approximations are going to get closer and closer and closer to the value of our solution x. But if x0 is not a good approximation of x, then these successive approximations aren't going to converge to the solution. They're going to, be, they're going to do just the opposite. But they're going to diverge away from the solution. And uh, our computer is going to go off into the sunset, spitting out all of these meaningless approximations. So if x0 is not a good approximation of x, then our sequence of successive approximations will diverge. And we have to allow for this possibility. And what we do is our algorithm has to include a limit that we'll call max, M-A-X, a limit on the number of iterations that are performed. In other words, if we perform, let's say, 30 iterations, and we're not desirably close, we're not as close as we want to be to our solution, then we stop the process and say, this process failed. Maximum number of iterations is exceeded. Uh, we have to do that. Now, on the other hand, if these approximations are good and they converge to the solution. Uh, we want to know how close these things have to be before we stop the process. It's very unlikely that we're going to get the solution exactly. So we want to decide how many times we keep on going with this process before we put on the brakes and say, okay, that's close enough, we stop. So in addition to having something called max that uh, <coughs> should have been part of our input, uh, we're also going to need something else that we call tolerance that tells us how close these things uh, have to be before we can stop. Back to the case where things happen the way we want them. If our sequence of successive approximations does converge to our solution x, we need some criterion that tells us or tells our computer when to stop the process. So for this reason, we have another variable. We call it tall, short for tolerance. And typically, we let tall be 10 to the ne negative 6, 10 to the negative 8, something like that. And we stop the process when two successive approximations, x of n plus 1 and x of n, differ by less than tall. So when the difference of two successive approximations is less than this, for example, 10 to the negative 8, uh, we stop and we print our last approximation as our solution. Uh, will it be exactly our solution? No. Uh, but if we have two successive approximations differing by 10 to the negative 8, uh, we're fairly confident that uh, our final approximation will match our solution to seven decimal places, something like that. Uh, and that's good enough. And uh, I guess that leads us to one other point about numerical analysis. Uh, the philosophy, for the most part, with numerical analysis is close enough is good enough. Uh, typically, we're not going to get the exact solutions that we want, but we're going to get close enough, and that will be good enough. And I will continue with this line of thought in just a second. Uh, I want to end this 
presentation of Newton's method just by amending my input because uh, we had this thing that we needed to enter as input and uh, we also had max and I just I, I want to make that amendment just so that if we write this program we'll know that those should be part of the input as well. So this is what our input should have been uh, when we started the lecture. The definition of f of x, the definition of f prime of x, x of not our initial guess, and we want it to be a good guess. Uh, we should have also included max, a positive integer. This is the maximum number of iterations to perform uh, if this number is exceeded, stop and print failure, max number of iterations exceeded. And we should have included the tolerance also. Stop when two successive approximations differ by less than less than tolerance, and print the last approximation as our solution. So those should have been part of our input. Please forgive me for overlooking those. Now, I wanted to get to something else, and this is just an important thing to realize about numerical analysis and numerical methods. Uh, numerical analysis is all about finding good approximations to things that we can't compute uh, with a calculator, let's say, things that we can't compute directly. Uh, for example, take this thing. Uh, we can't compute that because we can't compute the antiderivative of e to the x squared. Uh, we have e to the u, but oops, we don't have du. Now, if we had this, ah, now we could compute this because we have e to the u, and this is one-half du. Yeah, we can compute that. Oh, but if we take this x away, ah, we can't compute that. Suppose we want to compute it. Uh, we don't know what the antiderivative of this thing is, so how are we going to compute it? Well, that's where numerical analysis comes in. And we can get a good approximation to the value of this thing, maybe good to seven or eight decimal places. Uh, will we get the exact value of this thing? No. But it'll be close, you know, maybe close to, you know, the eighth decimal place. Everything will be right up to there. And in numerical analysis and in science in general, close enough is good enough. Uh, and I'll illustrate. In numerical analysis, Typically, we can't compute the exact values of those things that we're looking for, but we're going to get close. And we're going to get close enough that we'll be satisfied with the result. Now, when I was a student, I didn't buy into this at first. Uh, we had something like the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the x squared dx, and I, I thought, you mean we can't get the exact value? Well, then what good is it? 
And, and that's what I thought. You know, well, well, hey, if we're not going to get the exact value, why are we going to all this trouble in the first place? And what I didn't realize was, is that for most of my mathematical life, uh, from my teenage years up into college, I had already bought into that philosophy, but I didn't know it. Uh, for example, we're solving some sort of a problem, making some sort of calculation, and uh, we need to know the square root of 2. So what do we do? We punch 2 square root in our calculator, and then our calculator gives us something like this. I think that's what it is. And we go, oh, okay, that's square root of 2. And then we use that in further calculations and we're happy. And we don't ever look at this and say, wait a minute, that's not the square root of 2. I happen to know that the square root of 2 is an irrational number. And for your information, irrational numbers are non-terminating and non-repeating. This is a terminating decimal. This is not the square root of 2. We don't do that. Uh, we have a calculation that requires square root of 2. We punch it into our calculator. This is the value that it gives us. And as far as we're concerned, it is the square root of 2. And we're happy to use this in our calculations. So in our mathematical lives, we've already bought into this philosophy. We just really weren't aware of it. And this is what we do in numerical analysis also. Uh, we're not going to take something like this and get the exact answer. Uh, but we might get an answer that's close to like the exact answer up to seven or eight decimal places. And that's surely good enough for us. Uh, if it's not, maybe we can refine the scheme and get it even more accurate. But just like we don't care that we don't get the infinite decimal representation of the square root of 2 and that we're very happy to get this approximation as the square root of 2, in numerical analysis, we're going to approximate this and maybe get approximations that are accurate to six or eight decimal places. And we'll be happy. Uh, in numerical analysis, the philosophy is close enough, is good enough. We decide how close our results have to be, and we get approximations that are at least that close, and we're happy. Uh, are we ever going to get the exact value? Uh, rarely. Uh, we might on occasion, but rarely. But we will get approximations that are very close. And in numerical analysis and in science and so forth, close enough is good enough. Uh, work in engineering and in the sciences uh, is all based on tolerances. We do things within tolerance, we're going to get results that are satisfactory. And in numerical analysis, close enough will be good enough. And that's especially true when we use Newton's method to solve equations of the form f of x equals zero.